Um, let me introduce myself. My name is Don, and I work at the network office, and my job is to pastor pastors, and it's a little bit like herding cats, but that's okay. Your job is to take care of kids, and it's really like herding cats, okay? So uh, hats off to all of you. I came to Christ as a result of uh, children's ministry at age five, uh, vacation Bible school, the whole thing, um, and my dad was my pastor, and he took me and led me to Christ at the altar where I was going to vacation Bible school. And yeah, it's still a memorable thing. I remember a guy came to Christ at our church in Seattle where I most recently pastored. And he was ridiculing me coming to Christ. He was 61 years old and he'd come to Christ. And he was said, yeah, you know, how old were you? I said, five. He says, yeah, did you have to give up both drinking and women? I mean, you know, he's just ridiculing me because his life was so raunchy that he'd come out of he said, what could possibly, what, in other words, what do you need saving from when you're five? And I explained to him that lost is lost, whether you're five or 85, you know, and you know that in your heart. But what the, the point that stuck with him most is that at that time, 50 years later, I still remember the details. To this day, I can tell you what I was wearing uh, where we were at in the altar, the exact words that my father had. I mean, it was this memorable moment in time. Now, uh, I really came to Christ because I knew that's something that my dad wanted me to do. But I also realized that it was the right thing to do, and I also realized I didn't understand totally what I was doing. But when you're five, you're doing all kinds of stuff you don't understand. Anyway, people are telling you what to do all the time, and so you trust the people that are in your life. So you this morning are like the most trustworthy people that five-year-olds or eight-year-olds or 12-year-olds or whoever looks up to. I mean, that's a tremendous responsibility. They will remember what you train them, what you teach them the rest of your life. I have vivid memories. My dad was a church planter. I, re I remember sitting in a car while my teacher, because we didn't have any place for our class, and I was the only student in primary boys, we sat in the car, and she told me the story of David and Saul, with David running from Saul, hiding in caves. And the first time I went to Israel, and I looked up at those caves in En Gedi, because there's lots of them there, if you've ever been there, lots of caves there. And I remember thinking, ah, oh, that's, that's what she was talking about. And I can't remember her name, but I remember the story. I remember those things. So what you are doing has eternal value. Part of what you are doing is loving kids, and the best way to love them is to learn to love yourself. Jesus said some famous words in uh, Matthew 22. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as you what? Love yourself. Having margin in your life is like loving yourself. So before I pray and before I jump into the material, I want to hear from about I don't know, three or four of you. We'll see how it goes. Why are you here? What are you hoping to learn? I don't know your name, so tell me your first name and where you serve, and I'll just go with anybody. I think, is it Sean? And you serve at Sound Life. Yeah, so I'm not calling on you because I already know who you are and where you serve. No, go ahead, Sean. Go ahead. Why are you here? Just to, to learn, to prior, kind of prioritize and All right. get some good advice. Okay, somebody else. Why are you here? Yeah. Uh-huh. Right. Life demands, ministry demands, clash or balance. Right. Okay. Let's hear from a couple others. Yeah. My name is Michelle, and I'm a coach, and I am busy with my life as a kid, and so I feel like I do this for the Lord and just for my parents, and I'm not going to have time for anything else. Okay, good, good. So uh, ministry growth and then family growth and personal growth. Yeah, right. One more, yeah. Are you at Grove? Uh, Gro the what? <laughs> yeah, I know right where that is. My mother-in-law lives across the street from you guys. Oh, okay. Sure. Uh huh. So I'm trying to learn how to <coughs> scale it so that I can help her grow and give me, yeah, just how to get through what I'm going through for her. 
Okay. Okay, good. Let's pray. Jesus, help us get this right. Amen. Jesus got it right. He really did. He dealt with three critical issues, conflict, calendar, and crowd. And those are the three things that squeeze margin out of your life. Conflict will suck your emotional energy. Calendar will suck your time energy. And people will suck, well, they just suck everything. Okay? I mean, the ministry would be great if it wasn't for people. But the other side of that is that's job security for you. And that's who God loves. That's why Jesus died. So when people irritate you, it'd be a good idea for you to remind yourself, Jesus died for this irritant. Jesus went to the cross for this frustrating person. Beyond this conversation that deals with conflict or anxiety or tension, Jesus loves this person. Jesus, help me see them through your eyes. Now, those are little techniques. That's not necessarily what we're here to talk about. There, let, let's jump in. There is a little line that I want you to put in the notes section that's nowhere in your notes. And here's the line. There's always enough time to do God's will. There's always enough time to do God's will. God would never ask us to do something that we can't. 1 John chapter 5 says that we know his commands and his commands are not grievous. That is, they're not impossible. You would never ask your child to do something they couldn't accomplish. Your father in heaven will never ask you to do something you can't accomplish. Now, that being said, you can accomplish probably a lot more than what you think you can but the focus is on obedience and depending upon Jesus. So let's walk through this. You are the most important person in God's eyes. You were created to be a leader. But it's not so much about you as the leader as it is you the person. as what God envisions. You are God's plan. There is no plan B. He's calling you to step into your identity, your destiny with him. And there are no shortcuts to becoming the person that God wants you to be. The temptation here is to assume the responsibility for the work of Jesus. He wants us to pick up the mantle or the work that isn't ours. So when we pick up work that isn't ours, that we're not assigned to, it's in that moment that we start feeling heaviness. Jesus said, we're going to look at this scripture here. I think it's on the next page. Uh, let me define margin for you first. This is a 90-minute presentation that I'm going to edit as we talk. Okay, so if I skip spots, you've got it all in print anyway. I'll just make sure that you walk out of here with all of the blanks filled. I promise that I'll do that so that you will be able to sleep tonight because some of you, that's going to really bother you. All right, let's, let's talk about what margin is. I'm on page three for me. Is that where you guys are at? Defining margin. One of the ways that we have to walk out our faith is by living with margin. That's the first blank. Defining margin. Margin is the amount beyond what is actually needed. It's the reserves. It's the space between our current performance and our limits. So the two blanks there are needed and limits. Let me explain. You're looking at this booklet. The pages, uh, the, the words do not go to the edge of the page. There's margin. What would you feel emotionally if you looked at this booklet and the words went right out to the edge? You're, it, it's too busy for your eyes. You're all over the place. You need margin in order to have a sense of security. When you're driving down the road, you don't want three inches between you and the oncoming car. You want five feet. You want plenty of margin. Margin is the place where we live. Margin is the place of health. Margin is a place of generosity. So we're going to zero in on that. Here's what Jesus said. Come to me, all you who are labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke on you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Now, when we read the term yoke, we think Jesus is talking about a yoke that yokes oxen, ox, oxen or any kind of animal, for that matter. It's a wooden tool that goes over the necks of the animals that links them together so that they pull together. And, and that's one sense of it. But in Jesus' day, when a rabbi taught, his school was called the yoke. 
I will take up your yoke. So if I'm going to, I'm a young Jewish boy, I grow up in Israel, I have to study the, the um, Pentateuch, virtually memorize it, and then my hope is to someday grow up and be a Jewish rabbi. Because Jewish rabbis basically had it made. They were like the equivalent, well, not like the senators, but it was a good job. Everybody loved you, you were well respected, it was the highest calling of the day. So if a young Jewish boy wants to be a rabbi, it's only open to boys. They would go to a rabbi and they would say, I want to follow you, I want to take up your yoke, your school of learning, your discipline. And they would say, I'm ready to be tested. And the rabbi would test them. He would ask them a question. And if they failed the question, they not only couldn't be a rabbi in that rabbi's school or take up that rabbi's yoke, he couldn't go to any other rabbi. He's done. Then he has to go take up his father's profession or do something else. Now, every Jewish boy hoped that he would be able to grow up and take some kind of a rabbi's yoke on you. But rabbis never, never invited the masses to come take up their yoke. In fact, rabbis never called their own disciples. The disciples had to come to the rabbi. But Jesus turns the world upside down. And Jesus calls his disciples Now, one of his disciples came to him and said, I'll follow you. I'll take up your yoke. Jesus called them. Now, here's an interesting thing. Of all 12 guys, Jesus spent the night in prayer. Then he began taking up uh, or calling his disciples. Every disciple that he called had been rejected by another rabbi previously. Jesus literally built his church on rejects. I don't know about you, but that gives me hope. That gives me hope. So when Jesus says to the masses, come follow me, take my yoke, he's saying, I will not only be the rabbi to the 12 who are following me, I'll be the rabbi to anyone. Now the interesting thing about this scripture, another interesting, there's a lot in in the book, says, take my yoke, I'm gentle and lowly of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, or all who are labor. The King James Version says weary. There's a big difference between being weary and being tired. One of the signals, and this is not in your notes, you can write it in the margin. One of the signals is that you, that you don't have adequate margin is if you do not recover from a good night's rest. Now, if you get older, maybe you need a couple good nights rest, all right? Because as you get older, you're smarter, but you recover longer it takes you longer to recover so if you have an all-nighter with your kids you can recover the next day when you're in your 20s but when you're in your 40s you might not recover quite as quickly so give yourself some latitude there but here's the point if you wake up in the morning as tired as you were when you went to bed your issue is not tiredness it's weariness that's emotional that's not physical and that's what this is talking about um my personal story of not having margin in my life <laughs> I was talking with, uh, with Dan Mateer. Dan Mateer served on staff with me for six years, and we were good friends. And I was telling him that um, I remember standing in my kitchen table uh, saying to myself very clearly, other people burn out, I never will. I have almost inexhaustible emotional energy. It just, yeah. And about 18 months later, 15 feet from where I was standing, I was burned out. I was sitting in my bathrobe and my lazy lazy chair trying to figure out why my life was coming apart and I literally felt my mind leave my body and it would go out two or three feet and I would pray it back in. God has not given me the spirit of fear but of love and peace and a sound mind that would come back. And a few minutes later it would go out. And it's a weird sensation, it's hard to describe but when you're under an immense level of pressure and you feel trapped and no way out, That's the kind of pressure. These are the kinds of things that you exude. It happened twice. And I remember sharing with uh, one of our network elders, uh, Bob Stone, who really counseled me through that period. I said, Bob, have you ever heard anybody having experience like this? You know, they don't have margin and they just right on the edge of burnout. And he said, oh, yeah. I said, really? Who? He said, well, me. I said, you had the same experience? He said, well, my experience is a little different than yours. Your mind went out and then it came back. Mine went out and just kept right on going. Okay, and I kind of laughed and made me laugh, but he gave me hope. 
you don't have to hit the wall. But if you tell yourself that you'll never be out of energy, that you don't have to take care of your body, that you don't have to get the rest you need, this is an issue of the soul. Having margin is not about exercise physically. You all know you need to do that. It's not about spiritual disciplines. You all know that you need to fast and pray and read your Bible and go to church and tithe and be in a group. You know all that. This is the area of the soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions. Uh, Bill Hybels, noted influence, woke up in a hotel room one day, and he couldn't remember why he was there. He couldn't remember what city he was in or what conference he was to speak at, and it scared him. He was in his 40s because he had ignored the gauge of his soul. He said, I thought there were only two gauges in my life, my spiritual gauge and my physical gauge. But there's actually three. There's the gauge of your soul. And that's where margin comes in. All right, let's jump over. What happens when we cheat on our margins? If you cheat on your margins, here's what happens. Number one, your stress level goes up. As our margins decrease, our stress level increases. If we're stressed out, it's because we lack the margin in our life to deal with issues that we are facing. We don't have the reserves necessary to carry on a healthy pace. You know this is the case if you're the person in the family who oversees the checkbook and someone in your family tells you about an unexpected expense and as soon as they start talking about money, your mind is looking at how tight the finances are, how tight the financial margin already is, and all of a sudden you're emotionally stressed out because you've now lost your margin. When margins decrease, stress increases. You and I are designed to live within margin. Let me do a quick little survey. How many of you live on a budget? You have a written budget that you live on. Give me a little wave. Okay, put your hands down. How many of you can tell me exactly how much money you spent on gas in the month of July? You could go back to your budget and tell me to the penny how much gas money you spent on gas. Okay, raise your hand. Okay, I lost almost all of you except for three. If you can't answer that question, you don't have a budget. Now, I know I'm not being Dave Ramsey here. I'm just telling you. Writing your expenses down on one sheet of paper is not a budget. Planning how you will spend your money and maintaining accountability, that's a budget. And believe me, when you have a budget, you will be able to have margin because you can only be, wait for it, generous in the margins. You can't give away money you don't have. You can't give away energy you don't have. You can't give away time you don't have. You can't give away talent. You can't give away anything you have unless you have the margin to do so. I heard a counselor say that he could handle um, eight sessions a day, but he only took seven. Why do you only do seven? He said, I have a wife and family when I get home. They want to hear about my day. They want me to ask them about their day. So I only do seven sessions during the day, and my eighth session is my family. Now, I'm not their counselor. I'm telling you that I had to hold back that reserve, that reserve. So on the money thing, because money, I, I don't know of anything that stresses us out more than money. Maybe conflict does. You know, do you have an emergency fund? Do you, and you start small. You start small, but you start somewhere. All right, let's keep rocking. Number two, when margins decrease our fight or flight response takes over now the fight or flight response happens um, it's actually very self-centered we feel threatened and so those are our only two choices i either have to fight or i quit i fight or i quit as opposed to the emotional energy of actually talking the situation through we are forced to focus on our emotional energy, all on ourselves. Because our schedule is so tight, our demands are so tight that we're barely enough to get our job done, to get our ministry done, to influence our marriage, invest in our family, our school, our future. We're always thinking about ourselves. The fight or flight response is incredibly selfish. And when you live in a constant state, of either fight or flight, you're right on the edge, it has a very negative effect on our health and our well-being. Number three, when we have decreased margins, 
our relationship with others suffer? As I said, it's in the margin that you can be generous. Um, somebody came up a minute ago and said, uh, oh, uh, I think your name's a Amy. Is Amy here, the one who gave me the book? Yeah, you came up and you said, I know you're really busy and you probably don't have time, but you had a gift for me. You know what? I really like being able to turn to you and say, I'm not that busy. We can talk. And the reason I could do that is because there's margin that's built in my life so that my, my, I, I was already prepped for this session because I knew coming in here that a lot of the interaction was going to be one-on-one, -on -one, and I like that. Don't tell yourself that you're going to get work done on Sunday that you should do on Thursday or Friday. If you tell more than one person, oh, let's just talk about it on Sunday, you're cutting out your margin. Because I guarantee you, there'll be four or five other conversations that you have to have on Sunday that you're not scheduling yourself for right now emotionally. Are you, are you checking that out? Okay. Whatever you can get done ahead of time, get done ahead of time. It's not more spiritual to be spontaneous. It's actually more spiritual to plan. Look up all the scriptures on plan, planning, and plans in the Old Testament and the New Testament about God, and you'll have pages of notes because God's a planner. All right, number three, excuse me, uh, number four. Our relationship with God suffers. Lack of margin destroys relationships with God. How can we focus on God when we're living on the edge? We just don't have time. So our trust in God erodes. Now, if you're the kind of person that wants to get up in the morning and check Facebook or check your email or start connecting right off the bat, before you check in with Jesus, then you need to check that. It's a discipline. The most important relationships deserve the highest level of priority. And the way I know the most important relationships, they are the ones that will last the longest. So my relationship with Jesus will last the longest. It will be throughout eternity, correct? So that has the highest priority. My next relationship, which will last the longest, is with my wife. I'm only going to be a father, an active father, for maybe 20 years with my kids, and they're going to grow out. Now, I know I'll be the father the rest of their life, but things change, right? So, it's not, so the higher priority has to be with their mother, my wife, then with my kids and grandkids and my job inside there, right? So my relationship, the, the longest lasting relationships have the highest priority. I have to live in a dependent state of walking with Jesus. Number five, our ability to lead suffers. Lack of margin destroys our ability to lead. One of the reasons it does is because we don't have time to contemplate and get creative. You are only, I don't know if you know this or not, but you have to be pretty creative when you're in kids ministry, and you can't be creative if you're not rested, and you won't be rested if you don't have margin. These kids that you say you love, stop cheating them. Take a day off. Relax, rest, sleep in, go for a walk. Take a few moments and be alone. Chuck Swindoll said, the only trouble with success is that the formula for achieving it is the same as the formula for a nervous breakdown. We try and accomplish as much as we can and we squeeze margin out and lose control. We try and leverage our finances so we position ourselves financially only to realize one day we've actually lost control of our finances. The question as to why we allow ourselves to get there, why don't we just do less? Why don't we just spend less? Why don't we make less commitments? The short answer, here it is, fear. We're afraid of three things. Number one, we're afraid of missing out on the good life. So-and-so gets to do this, I want to make sure I can too. Number two, we're afraid of falling behind. Professionally in our experience, in our vocations, our friends have their kids in gymnastics, French class, and soccer, so we better have our kids in gymnastics, French class, and soccer. We try and keep up. Our calendars are full and our lives are empty. Number three, we stop. We're afraid of not mattering. Now, the word here is a question of significance. Significance. We think that we're going to get to the end of our life and realize that we didn't matter. 
We didn't change the world because we didn't make our mark. Significance is not a bad thing, but the way we are living may get us to the point faster than we need to be. We're afraid of failure. This is the fourth one. We're afraid that we're going to blow it, so we work harder and harder to ensure that our ministry succeeds. Let me suggest something to you. There's only one thing you need to do to be successful in ministry. Only one. This is the silver bullet, and Jesus gave it to us. If you will obey. If you obey Jesus, you will never run out of margin. If you obey, I'm not telling you it won't be hard times, but you'll have a path through them. By the way, obedience is the only way that Jesus actually knows whether you love him or not. Now I realize Jesus knows everything. I get that. But obedience is the only way that we know we love Jesus. If you love me, keep my commands. If as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. The Holy Spirit only does the bidding of Jesus. That's what John 14 says. The Holy Spirit only does what Jesus tells the Holy Spirit to do. So when the Holy Spirit prompts you, that's the time that you step up. So if it's more important for you to earn the kudo, and that's what you have to ask yourself. I love my pastor. I'm going to follow my pastor. I trust my pastor. He's a good leader. She's a good leader. I'm going to follow them. But if their approval is more important to you than Jesus' smile, you're the one that knows that. You have to know that, and that's an issue of your soul. Reducing the margin in your life is a poor strategy for success. All of these fears stem from a lack of trust, that's the next blank, in Jesus and are inflamed by self-reliance. We need to live in a purposeful life, a purposeful life. And we're doing ministry with Jesus. We need to live and lead with Jesus by aligning ourselves in his purposes. Ephesians 3, 10 through 21. You can just mark that. I'm not going to take time to read it. But it talks about living fully activated by his spirit. The most important element of life and ministry is deepening our trust in Jesus. The enemy tries to steal our joy and destroy our lives by turning our focus in a way that we can't understand. The idea is to make us prisoners of our own fear, robbing us of the freedom and the power. So simple, yet so difficult. Here, here's the point. Joy is strength. The joy of the Lord is my... Say it out loud. Okay, I'm going to do it again. That was really poor, all right? The joy of the Lord is my... Okay, a little bit louder. Joy of the Lord is my... All right. So if you don't have joy in ministry, what will you also not have? If you've lost your joy, and I'm not saying that there aren't hard seasons to go through, but listen carefully. Give me your eyes for just a minute, okay? Even when you're going through hard seasons, there's a purpose to the pain. There's a purpose to the pain. And if you just feel listless, just like, ah, oh, just going through the motions, it's, it's time to check in with Jesus. It is. It, it's time to check in because you're burning the candle at both ends. And as a wise man once said, you can burn the candle at both ends and get more light, but it won't burn as long. All right. Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Let her be. The only real control that we have is self-control. Self-control. And I want to suggest to you that self-control, that in itself is a fruit of the Spirit. Think of one area that you wish you had more self-control in, right? Everybody's got that idea, okay? Food, money, sleep, exercise, discipline with your kids, whatever it is. What's the one area of your life you wish you had more self-control in? Self-control is the byproduct of discipline. Discipline is the byproduct of obedience. If you are my disciples, 
Then you'll hold to my teachings. That's obedience. Then you'll know the truth. Then the truth will set you free. Discipline and disciple go together. The only real control that we have is self-control. Letter C. Stay connected to Jesus. It's an interesting thing. But when you steer children and people and yourself back to Jesus, you hardly ever go wrong. You just can't go wrong. I had a missionary couple come up to me about two years ago, and they had this question. Now, these are career missionaries, and I don't want to throw them under the bus, so I'm not telling you who they are. And it was just a legitimate thing. It, it shows you how, how this can creep up, okay? They're both very successful missionaries. They've each lost a spouse, and they were married one another, and they had to figure out which district was going to be their primary district. It was a pretty significant question because their giving base was either going to be in his district or in her district. They had to figure that out. Okay, so they came to me as the network leader, and they said, what do you think we should do? Here's the reason for going with his district. Here's the reason for going to her district. You know, and it, both of them had good arguments. They really were. So I just asked them a clarifying question. I said, when you pray about this and ask Jesus where he wants you to go, what do you hear in your heart? And they looked at one another, and they looked at me, and you already know what they said. We're sorry, Don, we've never actually really prayed about this. I said, well, I think that's your first step. Why don't you do that? They said, okay. And they came back about a week later and said, here's what we're going to do. Boom, boom, boom. Jesus wants to lead us, but he'll never force his leadership in our life. Staying connected. You can't do anything unless you're connected to Jesus. Seriously, ask the five-year-old in your ministry, what do you think Jesus wants you to do? Ask the eight-year-old. Ask your husband. Ask your wife. Ask yourself. What does Jesus want us to do? Knowing what he wants us to do is the critical part. Now, this whole scripture here under letter C, John 15, talks about the branch and the vine. How many of you are familiar with this scripture? Okay, good. I'm not even going to read it. I'm just going to tell you a couple of things about it. Here's what we know. Every branch that bears no fruit, tell me out loud, what happens to it? Every branch that bears fruit, what happens to it? Okay, it's a pretty weak answer on that one. Somebody give me a bold answer. What happens to branches that bear fruit? They get pruned. What's the difference between being cut and being pruned? Hardly any noticeable difference, except the one that's cut is cut off. The other one is cut less. If you don't bear any fruit, you're going to be cut off. If you do bear fruit, you're going to be cut. There's no way you can follow Jesus and not get cut. The difference is the outcome. The outcome is more fruit. And, and here's the thing about your ministry. You don't get to do your own pruning. The gardener does the pruning. I'm sorry, we're not going to be coming to church here anymore. We just feel that da 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 I'm sorry, I can't serve in this ministry any longer. I just feel like da 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 da, da. Whatever the reason is. Can I just suggest that go ahead and ask questions. I mean, if you get three or four volunteers quitting the same Sunday, that's a bit of a signal. You've got to look at yourself in the mirror, all right? But don't try and talk people into staying if they're headed towards the door. Because if you talk them into staying in that moment, you're going to have to talk them into staying next week and the week after that and the week after that. Let them go. Let the pruning begin. And then let the fruit happen. Here's the other thing I want you to get out of this scripture. It's about staying connected to Jesus. Because Jesus said you can't do anything on your own. There's no fruit. You won't be able to produce any fruit on your own. It's only when you're connected to me, which is code for be obedient, do what I tell you to do, all right? And, and you say to yourself, now, here's the way our American minds work. Okay, I think we'll be more effective if we stay connected to Jesus. But we can do something. And Jesus said, no, you can't do anything anything. 1 Corinthians 3 is the language of a cultural architect. No man builds on any foundation other than the one that's been laid, which is Jesus Christ. But each man builds according to his own ability. Some build with gold, silver, and precious stones. Others build with wood, hay, and stubble. And each man's work will be tested by fire, for it will reveal on the day. 
You can build, you can do something, but if you're not walking in obedience with an absolute assurance that Jesus has called me here, then it'll be wood, hay, and stubble and not gold, silver, and precious stones, and it will not last. So as a result of that, it is impo- if, if Jesus had good rhythm dealing with conflict, crowd, and calendar, the closer I am to Jesus, the better rhythm I'm going to have dealing with conflict, calendar, and crowds. Here's another line for you to write down in your margin that it's not there. And this is a true statement. Those of you who have read my book know that I say this over and over. Every problem you face in ministry is more about you and Jesus than you and the problem. If you have a problem with margin, you really don't have a margin problem, you have a Jesus problem. If you have a problem with finances, you really don't have a money problem, you have a Jesus problem. If you have a problem with your lead pastor, you really don't have a leadership issue. You have a Jesus issue. Now, I'm not saying that you simply pray and that makes everything go away. That's not what this is about. But it may be that you have more of a conflict obeying Jesus than you do your lead pastor and the issue is inside your heart, not between the two of you. I'm just saying. Okay, I'm leaving in an hour. I can get away with this. It may not be that you need more money. It may be that you need to spend the money you have differently so that Jesus can trust you more. Because if you're faithful with a few things, what will he do? Make you ruler over more. All right, let's keep rocking. Letter E. Develop a rhythm of self-care. There are three things that are listed there. Do you have blanks? Or are they there? Do you have recreation, rest, and health? Is that listed for you? Okay. Recreation. Meaningful recreation. I discovered years ago that if I could um, get outside, there are different pathways, sacred pathways that people have. Some people connect with God through music. Some people connect through God uh, intellectual reading. Some through relationship. They're called sacred pathways. Anybody read that book? Sacred, it's called Sacred Pathways. Okay. For me, I, I connect with creation. So if I can be on a motorcycle or if I can be on a boat or out in the, in the hills or the water someplace, if I can be offshore 25, 30 miles in the fog where you can't see the land, it's just like a happy place for me. I just love that, okay? It's just that's where I want to be. And I find myself spontaneously connecting to God. That's what recreation is. Look at the word recreation and put a hyphen between the E and the C. Recreation. That's what should happen when you recreate. Recreation. What re-energizes you? What connects you again with His creation? Starting with you. You are His creation. And then rest. God created us to work about a third of the time. There's no glory in busyness. Being busy doesn't mean you're being productive. Being busy just means you're being busy. So one of the things that I do, I'm going just, just throw a bunch of little notes out here. When you're feeling really busy, ask yourself, am I the only one that should be doing this? Or is there somebody else who could be doing this? If so, um, I had a youth pastor, Brandon Cameron, some of you might know Brandon, for years, and Brandon had this line. He said, those who do ministry alone deserve to do ministry alone. My professor in seminary, John Maxwell, he's getting up there now, but still a living legend, he said, never do ministry alone. Take somebody with you every time you do ministry. Turn it into a party. You got to do a bunch of busy work and assemble some kind of element for some party for the kids. So buy a dozen donuts and bring out four other volunteers. You'll cut your work to a quarter of it. It'll be a whole lot more fun, and you'll build Christian community in the context. And by the way, invite the newest people to your church. Don't invite the old standbys. Invite the newest people and the newest Christians. The newest people and the newest Christians. I love the fact I took a sabbatical in 2012 and I came back. I've been gone 17 weeks. And I walked through the door and Erica and Robert Elder, I didn't even know who they were. They're now greeting at the door. And the first words that I heard after being gone from 17 weeks from my church was, Welcome to Creekside. Are you new here? Is this your first time? My name's Erica. Okay? They had come to Christ, been discipled, and already given a new ministry during the whole time that I was gone. 
And I just smiled, and I said, well, it's been a while since I was here, and thank you for welcoming me. And would you like a program? I really would. How long have you been here? Oh, I've been here about two months, and I've been working at the door for about a month. This is my husband, Robert. Oh, someday I'd really like to hear your story. Okay, good. Nice to have you here, Don. And off I walked, okay? It wasn't until I got up on the stage to teach that morning she realized I was the pastor. <laughs> it was just this awesome moment. I like that. We had a whole series. By the way, we have a whole series of things. We called it Ministry Ladders, whereby you could let people serve in the church that weren't Christians yet. We let people play in the worship band that weren't Christians. We didn't let them sing, but we let them play instruments. We let them work on the sound. I met a guy yes, uh, last week who was working in the Mexican restaurant, Anna's, up on the ridge. Josh is here. And I was with Rob Roy Ranger, and he got up and he gave him a big hug. And I said, Rob Roy, who is that? And he goes, well, I met that guy. He hates Christians. He's Pakistani. He grew up Muslim. He wanted to grow up killing Christians. That was his goal. But he needed a job, and the only job he could find in Pakistan was, or maybe it was in the States, now he's come to the States, was uh, translating for a Christian conference because he understood Farsi. So he could speak Farsi uh, or Arabic, one of them. And he translated, and in the context of the conference, he came to Christ because he's preaching the gospel that he doesn't even know. So we let people serve at our church. Well, another role was handing out programs. Sometimes the oldest Christians, the most mature, are doing the most menial jobs. Come on, train some new believers. Let new believers hand out programs. And we would let people who weren't Christians hand out programs because what would happen? They're hanging out, what's your name? Rachel. So Rachel and I, and Rachel's a brand new Christian, or not a Christian yet, and she's handing out programs with me, and in between people, she'd say, how long have you been here? And I said, well, I've been here about five years. Well, how'd you find us? Well, my wife and I were having problems, and I tell her the story, you know, and how I can't, I'm just making all this up, you know. And so in the context of serving together over a few weeks, she hears the gospel and how the gospel's changed my life. And believe me, the gospel is very attractive. Jesus is very attractive when we take all the garbage off of it, you, you can't stay away from him. I'm getting preachy and I got 10 minutes, so let's keep going. All right, number one. Here's what the Bible challenges us about margin. Number one, we all have limits. God created us with limits. We all have different limits, but we all have limits. Women can be in four conversations at a time and keep up. Men can only be in one conversation at a time and keep up. And ladies, you can do more, but you're still limited. Everybody has limits, all right? Number two, we've been created as relational beings. We're not a robot. We're not a robot. God has called us to live with margin. Here's some examples. The Ten Commandments, the Sabbath. The Sabbath is not a suggestion. I have a Sabbath every single week. It's a different day. Because my schedule is so crazy weird, I have to have my assistant help me. What's the day off that I'm going to have? this week because I'm working all the time. Here's another example, the land. In the Old Testament, you could only plant crops six out of seven years. You had to let the seventh year, let the land lay fallow. Now we understand that the nutrients flow back in and it can give out money. You're only to live on 90%. Can I just say that if you're not tithing right now to your church, that you are cheating yourself? A, you are living with guilt because you know that you're not being obedient, and B, you're never going to see God miraculously provide. You just won't. We did this thing in our church called the tithing challenge. We challenged people to tithe for 90 days, and at the end of that 90 days, if you felt like you'd made a mistake or God hadn't come through or that you you know, were doing the wrong thing, just come to us and we'll refund you the money. We'll just refund you your money. Absolutely. Did it year after year after year after year. And we made it really easy. Just send us an email, text us, talk to whatever is the easiest way for you to communicate that you want your money back. But you had to give the first 10%. You had to give it to your local church because that's what tithing is. And you had to give by record. And if you did those three things at the end of 90 days, you felt like you'd made a mistake, fine. So I want to challenge you. Here's the deal. Nobody should be in charge of God's money that doesn't allow God to be in charge of their money. And all of you run a budget. You're in charge of God's money somewhere. I could, I could really drill down on this and go to the stealing thing and all of that, but I'm not going to go there because in your heart, you know that this is a matter of faith. Grow up. Grow up. Spiritually, I'm challenging you to grow up. 
You will never have margin in your money without obedience. You'll never have margin in your time without obedience. And you'll never have margin in your energy without obedience. All right, Jesus' three commands for gaining margin. This is how we get margin. We'll wrap it up and have a few minutes for questions. Three things Jesus says. Come to me. That means you can't stay where you're at. If you always do what you've always done, you da, 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 you get it? Your current system is perfectly designed to give you your current results. Your current decisions are perfectly designed to give you your current outcome. Jesus says, come to me. Don't stay where you're at. Come. Make a decision to change. Number two, take my yoke. I already gave you that explanation there. And then number three, learn from me. Learn from me. Can you even imagine at any point in Jesus' three-year ministry where he's sitting on a rock and Peter comes up to him and says, Lord, Lord, what's the matter? He goes, I just don't know what I'm going to do. I just don't know what the Father's going to do. I'm just so concerned about this next phase of ministry. Can you even imagine Jesus worried? Do you think he's worried about you? Do you think there's not enough provision for God Almighty to take care of you? We block the provision with our own disobedience. Jesus, help us lead well by obeying well. Amen. All right.